Amen. Tell me when we're good, Brother Chris. All right. It's great to see everybody here at Camp Creek Church. Thank you all so much for coming out. The last couple of Sundays, <laughs> we have been looking at what it means to be a, a, a kingdom citizen. Today, we're going to kind of look at uh, one of the aspects of being a kingdom citizen, and that's encountering God. We have so many different encounters of God in Scripture, and probably the one that's written about the most is the encounter of God with Abraham when he offered up Isaac. So if you got your Bibles with you, let's turn to Genesis chapter 22, because I know something about God's children. Every one of us wants encounters with God, whether we are at LA Fitness or, you know, praying at Zaxby's, it doesn't matter where we are. We, we all want an encounter with God in our lives, but sometimes, um, man, those encounters can, can ask you to do something kind of rough. So let's look at, um, because God has given us promises in the Bible, right? And those promises come in, in two general categories. We have the recorded word of God's promise in the Bible. But another aspect is the applied promise in our lives, because God has given us a lot of promises. Everything okay? Okay. God's given us a, a lot of promises uh, in his words, and maybe we'll talk about a couple of them at the end. Um. And when we come to Genesis chapter 22, God had given Abraham a promise years before that. Now we're coming to a point where the promise is going to change just a little bit. So read with me. We go to uh, Genesis chapter 22, and the word of the Lord says, beginning with verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Kids, that word tempt is also correctly translated test. So he's testing Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Now take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him up for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. Let's stop for just a second <laughs> and marinate in the scriptures that we have just read, because we have four contradictions that we've just read about. Uh, contradictions are things that, that don't go together. I, I guess we would label these apparent contradictions. So let's talk about the first contradiction that we've just read about, and it's a, it's a theological contradiction. Um, theological contradiction because it says here, it says in scriptures that uh, um, well, way back in Genesis chapter 12, God had told Abraham, I am going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to give you an offspring. Here in Genesis chapter 22, God is saying, kill that offspring. So that's a theological contradiction because God had said, I'm going to make you a great nation through your offspring, and now he's saying I'm going to kill the offspring. Theological contradiction. We also have a, a biblical contradiction because God told Abraham, offer up your son as a burnt offering. Guys, that's murder. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, you know. If a man spills another man's blood by another man, that man's blood will be spilled. The Bible tells us don't kill other people, don't murder other people. And so we have a, a biblical contradiction right there. So, but we also have an emotional contradiction because God is telling Abraham, Abraham, kill Isaac, the, your one and only son, whom you love. So you have an emotional contradiction in that I, I'm supposed to kill the very thing that I love? Ah, uh, <laughs> that's an emotional contradiction. And then we have a theological contradiction, we have a biblical contradiction, we have an emotional contradiction, but we also have a spiritual contradiction. Because he says, I want you to offer up Isaac as a burnt offering. That, that's an act of worship. So, Lord, you want me to kill somebody as an act of worship. And it just, we have four apparent seeming contradictions here because God has made a promise, 
And yet God looks like he, he's violating his own laws a, at this point. So how's Abraham going to respond? It's, 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 uh, it, I mean, what, what is Abraham going to do? Because let, let's extrapolate from this real quick. There are going to be times in your life when you feel a deep impression from God, but it's going to feel like a contradiction. And you're going to, Lord, I, I know I'm, I'm supposed to do this, but it's just, Lord, it, it doesn't seem right. So what is Abraham going to do when he's facing this contradiction? What are y'all going to do when y'all face contradictions? What, what are we going to do? And verse 3 says, <coughs> And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he saddled his ass. And he took two of his young men with him, and his Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place where God had told him. So it says that when Abraham was told to do this thing that he didn't want to do, that didn't make sense, that he got up early in order to do it. And we understand why, because the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, tell us what's going on in Abraham's mind. And it says in Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19, that the reason that Abraham was willing to offer up Isaac is because Abraham figured that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead, which is kind of striking if you think about it, because in Genesis chapter 22, at that portion of the Bible, no resurrection had ever taken place. As a matter of fact, the first time that somebody is going to be brought out from the dead is going to be in 1 Kings, and that's Elijah raising the widow of uh, Zareph's son. That's the first resurrection we see in the Bible. Prior to that, so Abraham... What are you basing this on that God's going to raise up Isaac? I mean, Abraham, no resurrection had ever taken place. Abraham, God had not raised the dead again, Abraham. How, how, how are you figuring that out? And here's the thing, and it's kind of a principle that all of us can handle. God is a big God, and Abraham knew that God was a big God, and maybe he hadn't seen God raise a human being from the dead, but he was able to extrapolate that because he was able to see God raise life out of death. What do I mean? Well, when God came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 11, Genesis chapter 11 and 12, no, Genesis chapter 12, Abraham was 75 years old and God made a promise to him, Abraham, you're going to be a great nation. I'm going to raise up an heir out of you. But that promise, it, it wasn't realized for 25 years when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. Now, for you kids that haven't had biology in high school yet, by the time you were 90 years old, your ability to make babies is dead and gone. I mean, your womb is dead. It's over. Uh -uh. It ain't happening. So maybe Abraham hadn't seen God raise a human from the dead, but he did see God raise a dead womb up. He was able to extrapolate, well, if God can do something like that, he can do something like raising up my son Isaac. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that, that he accounted to God that he could raise Isaac from the dead. Let me ask you something right now. As y'all are going through times and troubles and situations, no matter what your situation is right, right now, do you see God as a big God? Because one of the really cool things about Abraham is Abraham saw God as a big God. And Abraham saw that, you know, my wife having a dead womb, not a problem. My God, who made this promise about Isaac, and now he's telling me to do something that doesn't quite make sense, not a problem. God's able to fix it. Many of us in our lives have to have a bigger view of God, particularly when he doesn't make sense. And so what Abraham did was he remembered something in his past where God had been a real blessing, and then he was able to extrapolate it into the future. You know, the Bible has this thing about remembering. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, when Israel crossed over the River Jordan, they put down 12 stones, and they called them stones of remembrance. I hope that everybody in this congregation and everybody listening online are developing what you know as stones of deliverance. I got them in my own life. Uh, aneurysm. <laughs> That's a big stone of remembrance for me because the doctors told my mama, he's going to die tonight. 
Then another one, he said, they told mama where he had that aneurysm, he ain't going to be normal anymore. No, that's up for debate. That's the thing. <laughs> I got another one, you know. There was a time when I was in college and I was changing oil and I was underneath my car and my car was up on this. I had jacked it up and I had gotten underneath to change the oil and we were on a slight incline because I'm stupid. And I heard an audible voice say, get out from underneath that car. And I got out, and no later than five seconds later, that car slams down, and if I had been under it, I would have been dead. That's a stone to remember. It's, I remember when Olivia was born, and she had the cord wrapped around her neck, and all of a sudden, everything that was going hunky-dory, the doctor's like, she's got the cord wrapped around her neck, and the only words out of my mouth was, God, 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 God. That was my prayer. I wasn't even able to pray, Lord, you know, take care of my little baby who's got this emergency, and everything worked out fine. That's a stone of remembrance. I've got all these stones. I've got a whole bunch more. I hope you're thinking about your stones of remembrance, too, so that when you go through times of tempting and times of testing, that you can remember back when God has been faithful to you so that you can extrapolate into the future that God will continue to be faithful to you. But God did something else here in Genesis chapter 22 that's super cool. That's super cool because Abraham, for 25, and really by this time for about 40 years, Abraham had been working on a promise of God. And why do I say 40 years? Well, when Genesis chapter 12, Abraham's 75 years old. God said, I'm going to bring you in there. And then for 25 years, nothing, nothing. And then Abraham hears from God, and he has Isaac, right? And by this time in Genesis chapter 22, Isaac is a teenager, so 25 plus, I don't know, 15. So we're talking about more or less 40 years. And God does something really cool right here with this promise that he repeats in Genesis chapter 2. Because essentially the same promise in Genesis chapter 22 is the same promise that was given in Genesis chapter 1 with one exception, and it makes it kind of cool. So what what is Abraham going to do? It says that he got up early. And and when we're being obedient to the Word of God, it's always good to get up early and get about the business. So let's keep on reading. We uh, pick up. So, you know, uh, he said, because he says, and look, they get up, Abraham takes the servants, and they go to Moriah where God had told them to. And as they were going, you know, Isaac's looking around, and he's like, hey, Dad, you know, I see the sticks, you know, uh, you know, we got the fire, but where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham says to him, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. And then they go on up, and then the Bible says that Abraham bound the hands and the feet of Isaac. What faith Abraham has, but let me just mention something too, what faith Isaac had. Because I'm pretty sure that as a teenager, Isaac could have outrun the 100-plus-year-old Abraham, right? And Isaac submits himself. I I just want to encourage all of our teenagers, (laughs) all of our teenagers, when when your parents are doing what God has led them to do, uh, it's really cool to to fight with them and, and not fight against them, to be submissive to the call of God and other people's lives. Do you know that as, as teenagers and college kids and as friends, as friends, you can be a great blessing to your family by getting with the program of the way God has called your parents to lead? Do you know that as friends, as teenagers, as college students, and as members, you can be a great blessing to the church that you belong to by getting with the program as long as the church is consistent with the word of God. Well, Abraham was with the program and Isaac was with the program too. And God continues. And, and watch it. You know, and, and, and here's what it says. So he lays down Isaac. Isaac starts to pull back the big dagger because he's going to offer up Isaac. And we pick up with verse 12. And this is the second time he's called out Abraham. He says, and he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know. And if you happen to mark in your Bibles, you might want to underline this or circle it or just take a note out to the side. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. Now, this is difficult, and this is deep. God says, 
Now I know that you fear me because you haven't withheld your son, your only son. And here's the problem. Those three words, now I know. Because we believe, and the Bible teaches, that God is omniscient. Children with the word omniscient means is God knows everything, and everything that can be known, God knows. There's nothing that God doesn't know. That's the doctrine of omniscience. The polar opposite of the doctrine of omniscience is a philosophy called open theism that's held by a minute number of people, and it is heresy that God doesn't know anything. <laughs> um, but what we believe and what we teach and what the Bible says is that God knows everything. So how do you handle those words when God says to Abraham, now I know? Because the import is, is that just moments before this event took place, before Abraham raised up his dagger, the import is seemingly, I didn't know. How do you resolve that conflict? Well, let's talk about it like this. God knows everything. We know that, right? He knows the actual. He knows the potential. But he doesn't know the experiential. What do I mean by that? When I mean experiential, kids, what I'm talking about is an experience of. Let me give you an example. God knows about sin. God knows the ravages of sin, but God does not know the experience of sin because God has never sinned. God knows Abraham loves him. God knows that Abraham will be faithful, but God didn't know the experience of Abraham's love. Um, this is why God became a man so that he could have the experience of what it means to be a man. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about he was tempted in every way, just like we are, talking about Jesus. So Jesus came in, took on humanity, so that he could experience what it was to be tempted. That's what Scripture says. So that he could identify with our infirmity, so that he could have the experience. So he knows the actual, he knows the experience, potential, but he doesn't necessarily know the experiential. And in this moment when he says, now I know that you love me, he knew that Abraham actually loved him. He knew that Abraham, all the potential of Abraham's love, he knew that Abraham was capable of doing this. He knew it, but he hadn't had the experience of it yet. And now he had had the experience of this yet. And, and let me tell you something. Abraham had the experience too. Because when Abraham has that experience with God, God is about to do something that is just monumental in Abraham's life. And I say that to say this. <laughs> when we operate in obedience to the word of God, we can experience the promises that God has already given to us in a way that we have never experienced before. We can know that God loves us. We can know the potential of God's love. But it's not until we really operate in obedience that we have the experience in our soul of what it means to be loved by God. It's not until you lose a child in utero. It's not until you have a husband that divorces you. It's not until you really struggle and come to your wit's end because of a child that is on the spectrum that you can, really, you, you can experience God's love in a way so deep that you will not experience it when everything is going hunky-dory. And so God is saying, Abraham, now I know. I, I've experienced your love for me. And so uh, he says, and, and here it is over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus became a man so that he could experience what it's like to walk around with infirmities. So guess why God puts us in trials that don't make sense sometimes? 
when it seems to be like, man, it's just, I'm going through this test, I'm going through this trial, things just stink right now. It, it's so that he wants us to experience his love. And quite frankly, he wants to fill your love at a deeper level. He doesn't want to just hear about your faith. He doesn't want to just hear about discussions about your faith. He wants to feel your love. And and what makes him feel it? When you choose him over something you already love, right? And and he says, you know, I I know you fear me because you didn't withhold your only son from me. The only one you've got whom you love, you didn't withhold him. When you had to choose between me and him, you chose me. And, and you know, I can, I can really feel your love right now. And then what happens next? It says in verse 13, And Abraham raised up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorn, horns. Man, this has got to be the quietest lamb, I mean the quietest ram in human history. I want you to notice something here. The, the ram was always there, right? The ram, because he was already caught in the thickets. His horn was wrapped up in the thickets, and the ram was... He was already there, but the revelation of the lamb didn't... The revelation of the ram didn't become apparent to Abraham until after his obedience. But the ram was already there. It had already been provided. But Abraham wasn't allowed to see it wasn't revealed to him until after his obedience. You know, God has has already provided (laughs) our substitutionary atonement in Jesus Christ. God has already provided our eternal salvation. But sometimes when we get really stressed and we can't really see all the great provisions that God has provided, it's because we haven't been obedient to the call of God in our lives. There are blessings in obedience. And a lot of times, one of my my Pentecostal friends, they'll say, I I want a deeper revelation from God. Can I tell y'all something? God's revelation is Jesus Christ. So I tweaked that a little bit. I want a deeper revelation about Jesus Christ and how much he loves me because there's no other revelation that God's going to give us than Jesus Christ. (laughs) Jesus is the answer to our problems. He's the answer to our stress. He's the answer to our worry. If you have a parent that is is suffering with Alzheimer's and you're at the end of your rope, Jesus is the answer. If you have a child that's on the spectrum and an ex-husband who's an absolute tool, Jesus Christ is the answer. If you have a problem with a relative who's in and out of prison, Jesus is your answer. And there's some aspect about Jesus, and I don't know whether it's forgiveness or whether it's steadfastness. It's the answer to your particular situation, but Jesus is our answer. And our lamb (laughs) has been provided. So Abraham looks up in the revelation. His eyes are opened up, and he sees the ram. See, a lot of us are looking for the ram when we haven't finished with the obedience. And so God's keeping the ram quiet. The solution was already there. It just hadn't been revealed. And it says in verse 14, And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh and it said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen and the angel of the Lord called upon him Abraham out of heaven the second time now here's a big principle in scriptures when God calls you two times it's time to listen up I mean and here's the zinger and this is what we're building to it says in verse 16 so the angel of the Lord which is a pre-incarnate version of Jesus Christ calls out to him says Abraham and said, this is the angel speaking, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. So here's what God does. He says, look, I have now sworn to you, I swear to you, when we take that language, the theological import is this. The promise that God made in Genesis chapter 12 is, Abraham, I'm going to give you this, this, and this. That's a promise. But when God swears upon himself, it becomes an oath. And that's important. A 
promise is a promise. And, and with God, when God promises, we can count on that because all of God's promises are yea and amen. That's what the scripture says. It means that God's always going to do what he promises to do. But let me tell you something. When a promise becomes an oath, <laughs> man, you got a contract. But what's interesting about this oath is typically when you make an oath, here's how an oath is made in the Old Testament times. Um, it's like the difference between a unilateral and a bilateral contract. But I would go to you and I would say, I will mow your lawn, and if I don't, I will pay you $100 because that oath has to have some sort of punishment if it's not fulfilled. So an oath is a promise plus a punishment for unfulfillment. And God says to Abraham, because God can't swear on anything other than higher, because there is nothing higher than himself. He says, Abraham, here's where I swear to you. I, I swear to you. And then he repeats the same language that he had said in Genesis chapter 12. A promise had become an oath. And there's a reason for this. And we see it in, in the book of Hebrews. But I want you to notice something about this oath he took because there's one additional phrase that God adds to it. And it says, and he shall possess his enemy's gates. So, you know, remember when, when, when Paul was talking and he was saying, you know, there was a time when we've talked about Abraham and the Abraham, the promise was given to Abraham and his seed, and the seed of Abraham was actually not a bunch of people. The seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. And so right here, so it's a seed singular, like a singular apple seed as opposed to a whole bunch of seeds. So this promise to Abraham and his seed was given actually to Jesus Christ and says, and he shall possess his enemy's gates, which is he's given all authority over the enemy. And Jesus himself confirmed that when he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and upon earth. I've got all the authority. So this is talking about Jesus Christ and, it, and he shall possess his seed. But here's the way that the oath is really important. He says, I swear by myself. So what God has done with the language that we have just read is saying, I am going to bring this about even if it costs me my own life. This is going to happen. My seed is coming and all authority is being given to him. Why did God do that? Why did he change it from the promise to an oath and Hebrews actually answers that question for us. And if you got your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 6, it's very explicit why, why God had done this. And which, well, let's get to it, and then I'll, I'll close out. Because in Hebrews chapter 6, um, it talks about the story of Genesis chapter 22. And when we read in verse 13, it says, For when God made promises to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Okay. We just read that, verse 15. And so having, after he, Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men swear by greater an oath or confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Well, that's curious. For men barely swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So there's something about oaths back then that just gave a lot more assurance. It's in the end of all strife. Verse 17, wherein God willingly more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. So he gave, he, he changed it from a promise to an oath so that Abraham in his progeny could rest assured in the immutability of God's counsel. That's a lot of King James and a, a, lot, of, a lot of big words. Let me, let me take it down a notch for our kids. I, I can promise you the sky and the moon and the stars. Promises nowadays are, and even back then, a, a promise, that's a nice thing. But when you take an oath, that, that kicks it up a notch. That gives you assurances that promises don't give you. If I say, I'm, I, I promise to mow your lawn, well, that's kind of an open-ended promise. Well, when are you going to mow the lawn? And I can break my promise. But if I break an oath, it's going to cost me. And God said, I swear upon myself. So he's saying, look, I, I'm going to do this even if I have to lay down my own life to do it. 
And it says that the reason he did it was because an oath for men is an end of all strife. They can stop working to obtain the promises of God so that they can rest assured that God is not going to change his mind. The whole purpose of God giving an oath is so that you can stop working, so that you can get off the treadmill of your religious performance trying to obtain God's promises by your hard work. That's what it's talking about. You know, Hebrews chapter 4, right before all this, it said, we labor to enter into his rest. There is a rest that exists for the children of God. We, we can get off the treadmill of religious performance because God's promises were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who, oh, by the way, did lay down his life. So it's not up to you, your eternal salvation. It's not up to you. It was up to Jesus Christ. We're not on the Jesus plus plan. It's not Jesus' perfections and your acceptance. It's not. It's not Jesus' perfection and your ability to hold out until the end in sinless perfection. It's not. It's not up to Jesus', it's not a Jesus' sacrifice and your ability to, to be baptized in the right church. It's your ability to understand. It's your ability to pass the Lisman test. And oh, by the way, did you vote Republican or did you vote Democrat? Did you avoid R-rated movies and did you avoid Harry Potter? It's none of that. It has nothing to do with you. Get off your treadmill of religious performance and rest in the grace of God. And when you rest in the grace of God with obedience... What Romans chapter 5 says is we now have access into this grace wherein we stand. So if you will live your life in obedience, this grace that God has put you in, you really get to enjoy it. Or put it another way, when you live a life of obedience, then you can see the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ that he has provided for you so that when you fail, and you will, Time and time and time again, you can always look at Jesus and say, you know what? In him, God is well pleased. Because Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 22, can we talk about Abraham for just a few seconds before we shut it down? Between the initial promise of God and then the oath of God, Abraham did a lot of things wrong. He, uh, he had children by another woman that wasn't his wife. Uh, he tried to sell out his wife to Pharaoh, not Pharaoh, yeah, Pharaoh. Um, he lied. So Abraham's doing all these things ready. So in a sense, the promise was ready for Abraham, but Abraham wasn't ready for the promise. So what happened in that space of 25 to 40 years? God was getting Abraham ready. God was getting Abraham ready. Do you know that right now God is working in your lives and all of us are facing various trials and temptations and things, but really it's God working in your life to reveal the, the, the preciousness of his promise to you. Let, let me give you some promises that God has, has given to us in, 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 in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That, that's a promise. When you prioritize God, things are going to be added to your life. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. This is one of my favorite ones. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ. Hey, can we add a couple of nethers there? Neither life, nor death, nor principalities, or powers, or things present, things to come, height, death, any other creature. Neither my actions, neither my sin, neither my stupidity, nor my anger, nor my moral failures can separate me from the love of God. That is a promise. I need to be reminded of that a whole bunch. How about y'all? Then there's one over in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse, verse 7, and I love this one. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. That's a promise of God, too. 
So in 2021, with the state of Georgia being in the red zone for COVID, I want to remind you of a promise of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear. For all my very conservative friends out there that are just fearful about what the incoming administration is doing, God has not given us a spirit of fear because we serve a big, big God. And he's bigger than the President of the United States, the United States Congress. He's big. So relax. Perfect love casteth out fear. Let's end with one more. Uh, over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. As children of God who are living in very trying, testing, and tempting times, we always can go to our Father because of what Jesus Christ has done. So let's not only go, let's go boldly so that we can find mercy and we can find grace experientially because it's already been given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. We've just forgotten about it. So if y'all will, bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what Jesus has accomplished. Father, we thank you that we get to see him in Scripture and we get to see him across this earth. Help us to be better ambassadors of him in the way that we treat people. Lord, in the way that we see ourselves. Because Jesus Christ is transforming. And Lord, we're all in different levels of transformation right now, but continue to transform us. Uh, and when we go through the times of testing and trying, Lord, please remind us that in those times of testing and trying, that those are the times that you're doing great work. Thank you, Lord, that you just didn't promise, but you gave us an oath. And thank you, Lord, that we see in Jesus that you fulfilled that oath. Help us to be more like him in all that we say and do. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.